Hey everybody, welcome to a lecture on nutrition. Uh, let's dive into this thing and see where it takes us. This is an interesting lecture and one that should at least terrify you a little bit. So let's start here on the title slide. Uh, this is the classic food pyramid that I grew up with. I hope few of you have experienced this because today this is seen as a blatant scientific lie. All right, uh, the idea that most of what you consume in a day should be rice and pasta and bread, it's just mind blowing. And it's taken us, this has taken us to our current world of just massive health crisis. If you're not aware, the United States in particular is in the seat of a massive healthcare crisis as a result of our awful dieting practices. What you eat is so different from what your father and mother, grandparents, great-grandparents, their great-grandparents, people 100 years ago, it's so different from what people have eaten in the past. I mean, it's, it's mind-blowing. And I'm here to tell you, we eat terribly, terribly compared to them. So this is almost like a little public service announcement. And man, writing this thing up, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I need to be doing better myself. I get these annual health screens and they get worse every year and it's 100% because of my behavior and my dieting that I have issues, 100%. Let's not get too deep into this. I'm not gonna conspiracy theory you too hard, uh, but a lot of the medications that we take, like I look at my, my parents and my brother and I see the medications they take, they sort of have a decision they can take the medications or they can alter their behaviors and it's easier just to take the pill. Whereas if you alter the behavior, you could get away from all the medication. That's what we're here to talk about today, folks. We're here to talk about how we can better serve our own bodies and live to see a brighter tomorrow. So let's see where this takes us. <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, now, man, I really debated about how to start this thing. Uh, and I figure the best way to do it is to explain to you that we have been lied to for a long, long time. So let, let's just proceed. Before we do anything else, uh, to better understand your digestive system, which is what you should have been doing recently, uh, we really need to have a better grasp of, of what we take in and process, i.e. the nutrients we consume and uh, how they behave in our system. So any nutrient nutrients are parts of food that we need for our general physiological functions. Okay, so uh, if you want to have strong bones, you got to have calcium. If you want to build muscle, you got protein. Like, yeah, you have to have certain things. There's a famous comment that you are what you eat. That's a lie and improper. A better way to look at it is uh, that you should eat what you are, okay? Uh, so if you were to consume foods that are roughly uh, balanced in terms of the uh, atoms and demands, the proteins, nucleic acids, what have you, that your system is built from, then you would be relatively healthy. But we tend to consume foods that are really outside of the demands of our body, and uh, then our bodies are stuck trying to figure out what the heck to do with them. So it changes our whole physiology. Okay, so what are nutrients? Well, nutrients are carbohydrates, i.e. sugars, proteins, lipids, i.e. fats, and then vitamins and minerals. Uh, and vitamins and minerals kind of take a lower stance on the rest of these. These are uh, parts of our big organic molecules, nucleic acids could be lumped into this, but you know we don't necessarily seek those out as much. But in, anyway, so uh, the main foods that we consume are carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, and then vitamins and minerals will also play a role in this. All right, <clears throat> first things first. Let's establish that we have a problem. And we do, we have a major problem. What percentage of Americans are overweight? <clears throat> just overweight, not obese, just all of them, all people whom are a little overweight. And we can very easily measure this, okay? Body mass indexes and things have been out for a long time. We know about what you should weigh based off your height and age. About 70% almost three out of four Americans are overweight. What percentage of Americans have type two diabetes? And in most cases, type two diabetes is gonna be somewhat modulated by your activity. All right, so you, uh, 
your choices will lead to type 2 diabetes in a lot of cases. And we're not talking about type 1, we're talking about type 2. This would be, in theory, adult onset diabetes. What percentage of Americans have type 2 diabetes? And the answer is about 1 in 10. About 10% of Americans. 10%. As a result of poor dietary choices for the most part and cess selectivity. And these are crazy numbers. Like, I, I, how do I you know, go further from this? These are, these are crazy numbers. Um, it's projected that about one in three kids born after the year 2000 will see type 2 diabetes by the time they're uh, of mature age, we'll say, of older age. One in three. The numbers are astounding. And it's because of our dietary choices today. That's what this is all leading us to. Uh, we're ending up with massive quantities of what we call metabolic syndrome that's leading to these issues. So metabolic syndrome leads to these, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of issues with our weight sizes, blood pressure. You can do a blood panel and see your triglycerides, your glucose, your HDL and LDL, which we'll be talking about here in a second. That would be low-density lipoproteins versus high-density lipoproteins. It's all just out of whack and crazy. And as a result of it being out of whack and crazy, it's limiting our lifespans or forcing us to take massive quantities of medication to deal with it. And it's all, well, it's mostly because of our dietary choices. Mostly because of our dietary choices. In the last 30 years, obesity rates in American children have tripled. About 9 million kids older than 6 are obese. And you know that the weight gain fuels a whole host of other secondary, very negative problems, right? Man alive. Uh, you know, this is a dumb statement, but I'll make it anyway. When I was a, a younger man, let's, I'll just lay it all on the table for you. So I was in kindergarten in the late 80s. We didn't have any overweight kids. I don't remember any overweight kids. That is not the case anymore, and it's different different because of our diet and our activity levels. Our activity levels and our diet have completely changed and we need to address it in the worst way. All right. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Nikolai Anikov. Um, this goes back to 1913. Anikov or published a study that was really no big deal from his perspective. He didn't think anything about it. Uh, he simply took a bunch of rabbits, fed on pretty much straight cholesterol and then dissected them after a period of time and they all had really bad atherosclerosis. Okay, they, they had built up some plaques in their arterial networks, uh, you know, that would lead to strokes, heart attacks, what have you. Um, so Ankov says if you feed rabbits cholesterol, they tend to accrue cholesterol in their bloodstream and it builds up in their arterial networks and it can kill them. Okay, um, Anikov saw this as a mammalian model. Now, that doesn't really work because rabbits don't have the enzymes to break down cholesterol. Rabbits are plant eaters. So they eat a bunch of cholesterol that's going to build up in their arterial networks because it hangs out in their bloodstream. They don't have the enzymes to deal with it like we do as well, as well. Uh, so you end up with problems. No big deal. It's happened. You know, studies happen all the time, but this kind of got pushed under the rug. Nobody thought anything about it because, you know, you realize that there's an intrinsic bias here. Rabbits don't do well for the study. Then in the 1960s comes Ansel Keys. At the time, we had a president who was having heart issues. I think it was Eisenhower, don't quote me. Uh, and as a result of this, America's like, wow, we really need to address heart disease. You know, there's people that are struggling and we need to figure out what the heck's causing these uh, heart attacks and strokes and what have you. We need to figure this out and go from there. So Ansel Keys, here he is on the cover of Time Magazine, famous, what a wonderful dude at the time, he comes out with the famous seven country study. What this does is it balances caloric intake from fat versus cardiovascular disease, okay, cardiovascular disease, and uh, he grabbed seven major countries with Japan, uh, people in Japan consuming very little caloric intake from fat, and then the United States consuming massive amounts of calories from fat, and we in the U.S. have an extraordinarily high rate of cardiovascular disease, whereas those in Japan have an incredibly low rate of cardiovascular disease. And Ansel Keys shows this and says the more fat you eat, the higher your chance of cardiovascular disease. You're probably going to die of heart disease if you're eating too much fat. Uh, it seems legitimate, and it's from this that this 
chart comes, okay? Our uh, breakdown of the food pyramid is directly from the work of Ansel Keys, uh, limiting fats and giving us lots of other stuff to balance out our caloric intake. Problem, this is fake. <laughs> Total nonsense. Uh, he, he made this up completely fabricated. Uh, in reality, he had access to something like 40 some odd countries worth of data, and he just picked ones that he thought would fit the line as best as he could. So he, he totally faked the data. Um, and lo and behold, Ansel Keys was being play, uh, paid handsomely by the sugar industry, and I think specifically by the soft drink industry, you have to double check me on that, uh, to do this. He basically was the hitman for fat because when you take the fat out of food, it tastes really gross. So what do you do to make it taste better? You put sugar in, okay? So the sugar industry loved this because it started making low fat options for everything. Go to the supermarket today, you got your salad dressing and your low fat salad dressing. You got your milk and your low fat milk. You got your cheese and your low fat cheese. Like you got low fat everything. And to make it taste better, flip it over and look at the sugar content. Low fat means high sugar, Regular means less sugar. It's the craziest thing you've ever seen in your world. So what we did uh, is we traded out fat for sugar. And lo and behold, nothing changed. <laughs> so, so our rates of cardiovascular disease, if anything, are as bad as they've ever been. So um, over time, up to 2010, rates of cardiovascular disease have been pretty daggum stable. And you need to remember that this is along with us having way better medical practices than we had in the 1960s, way better medications, and still the numbers are pretty dead gum flat. I mean, yeah, yeah, nothing's changed, nothing's changed. In fact, uh, in the 70s, this guy, John Yutkin, I, I didn't have a name earlier, I've edited my slides just a little bit uh, since then, so, so let's talk a little bit about it. Now, let, let's make sure we're together on this. Since we started changing things, you'll see, where am I at? Am I crazy? Okay, here's strokes and heart disease. Yeah, 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 okay. So you'll see that these have not really changed a whole lot. Not really changed a whole lot. And that's with, look at what's happened to smoking in the United States. Like nobody smokes anymore compared to what they were doing in the 1960s. Uh, look at our general health care. Look at our medication. It's so much better now. And in the 1970s, John Yutkin, this guy here, he realized it. He was like, wow, we have changed how we're doing business and nothing has actually changed in terms of the rates of people dying from strokes and heart attacks. Clearly, what we're trying is not the causative factor. We got other issues. And boy, Ansel Keys and his compatriots went after John Yutkin like it was going out of style. Okay, like hardcore hit pieces. You just would not believe it. It'd be uh, 25, 30 years before people looked back into Yutkin's work and realized he was right and Keyes was lying to us. So we have been living off of some interesting dietary concepts. That's what I'm here to tell you folks. Interesting dietary concepts. And that brings us to modern day. Uh, you can go and, and you can pull up this My Plate and get a governmental um, input, if you will, as to what you should be consuming on a daily basis to be a healthy human being. Uh, it isn't the worst thing ever, but there are some real fallacies built into the system. And my goal as we move forward is to explain to you these fallacies and help you work your way through it and try to help you know, at least know, how you could uh, live a healthier life, okay? Uh, it's hard to do the hard work, man. It, is that English? It's tough to do the work to maintain this healthy lifestyle, but I'm gonna tell you how to do it. So here we go. Basic concepts, carbohydrates. So these are sugars. Uh, carbohydrates, be them simple sugars, the big honking polysaccharides are very important as an energy source for our bodies. The reason they taste so good is because our early ancestors had very little access to them. So when they were available, like we were gobbling them up. That's why they taste so good to us, all right? It is our system and our, our deep uh, ancestry being like, wow, you should get as much of that as you can because it's a rare thing and you need to gobble it up as fast as possible. Uh, because you can think, you know, 100,000 years ago, where are you getting glucose and sugars like this from? 
pretty much just ripe fruit. And that's very rarely available, okay? Uh, you're not getting hardcore or straight glucose like this or, or even, you know, more complex sugars very often at all. So our bodies are just wired to love them. So if you want a food so uh, source, to taste better to humans, what do you do to it? You add sugar, and we're like, wow, that's delicious, okay? Uh, it's, it's all because it was very rare in our early diet. Our ancestors did not have access to high amounts of, uh, of straight carbs like this. Now, in the world around us, there are what are called complex carbohydrates and what are called refined grains, refined carbohydrates. Uh, complex carbohydrates are more natural sources. Things like beans and nuts and fruits and these sorts of things. Uh, these are pretty healthy for you in the grand scheme. So you can eat a lot of fruit, a lot of nuts, a lot of grains and be in pretty good shape. Still be taking in lots of carbs uh, because these have a lot of vitamins and minerals in there. Man, I got chill bumps. It's so straightforward. Uh, a lot of vitamins and minerals in there. They have high fiber. So if you're eating, uh, you know, good fruits. Now, let me just, man, there's so much to talk about. Um, you got to realize that the fruits we eat today are not the same as the fruits that we had even 20, 30 years ago. Go and look up what a strawberry looked like in the 1920s. And it ain't the same strawberry you got today. The ones we got today are three, four times the size, uh, way more sugar content. We've genetically engineered things. We have done selective breeding. We've done all sorts of things. Like corn today in the same corn we had 100 years ago. It's very different, okay? So even, even complex carbohydrates that are from natural products um, are vastly different than what your ancestors had, but they're the best we got, so you know, use them. Uh, high, the, the goal here is, what I want to say is, you want to get as much fiber in your grains as is physically possible, okay? As much fiber as is physically possible. Consume these complex carbs. We don't want refined grains. Refined grains uh, are like white bread, cakes and cookies, sugars, straight sugars of this fashion. Uh, let's see what I want to say here. Yeah, whatever. So let's talk about it. Uh, if you get a spoonful of sugar and a slice of white bread and you consume them, by the time they hit your stomach, there is no chemical difference between them. By the time they hit your stomach, they're both pretty much just straight sugar, okay? It's the same thing because that slice of white bread's got very little to no fiber in it. It's got no vitamins and minerals. It's got very little happening. Uh, you drink a soft drink. You're basically just drinking sugar and water. Okay, there, there's nothing fancy to it. No vitamins, no minerals, no fiber, no nothing. It, it's gonna be the same thing as just taking spoonfuls of sugar. And what you're gonna find is that most of what we consume these days, it's refined grains. Like, man, you, go, to, uh, go to McDonald's, get you a combo meal. You're gonna have bread, you're gonna have soft drink. The potatoes from those fries are pretty well broken down already you're getting just straight sugar, okay? The insulin spikes are just off the charts. And that's what's happening here, is when we're consuming lots of refined grains, it spikes our insulin levels. And when you spike your insulin levels, man, your whole system just goes haywire. Uh, this leads to obesity. This leads to major heart disease. This leads to certain forms of cancers, liver disorders, insulin resistance, i.e. type two diabetes, you name it, all kinds of problems from refined grains. Refined grains, i.e. that straight up sugar here and here, they're our problem, okay? I'm not gonna say fat's not an issue, uh, but the refined grains are, whew, they're a big deal and something you need to limit from your diet. Man, I've talked to so many folks that have just cut off soft drinks and I can't do it. I'm gonna try to do better but people can just cut soft drinks and <laughs> it just changes their whole physiological output. Like their whole behavior, the way you sleep, everything changes, it's crazy. Ah, uh, all right, where am I at? Yeah, yeah. Oh, jeez, have mercy. Okay, so what happens? Well, when you consume a natural carbohydrate product, if you're getting some almonds and you're chowing down on almonds, or if you eat a salad, uh, and you have just vinegar on that salad, if you are consuming uh, natural products that have the fiber, what it does is it slows down the rate at which the sugars get into your bloodstream. Man, it's so hard to even teach this because it's there's so much to talk about. All right, when you consume natural products, what you see is your blood sugars, uh, they move very slowly 
up and down. And they stay kind of in a normal range. You don't see crazy spikes uh, like you would otherwise. So when you're consuming natural products, your blood sugar slowly rises. And when it gets to a certain point, you release a little bit of insulin, and it brings it down just a wee bit. Okay, so this is uh, consuming natural products. Imagine you're out in the world and you eat a banana. That's what's happening, boom, right there. You're gonna get a little bit of sugar, but it's gonna rise and drop, natural process. What if you eat some donuts, a couple donuts, okay? What that's gonna do is it's gonna spike your blood sugar. And when you spike your blood sugar, you're gonna crank out insulin like it's going out of style to try to control this crazy spike. Man, I got food here on campus last week at a food truck and I just got a, a Polish sausage with all the, you know, all this good stuff on it. And when I get the darn thing up in my office and I look at it, they've like caramelized the daggum sausage. It was sweet flavored. I was like, God dang it. You know, why is this the case? Ah, anyway. So what this does is it spikes your blood sugar. When your blood sugar spikes, you crank out insulin. When you crank out insulin, your body's got no alternative but to take all that excess sugar and either turn it into fat or just dump it straight into your liver. And when you're dumping sugar into the liver, man, you're just asking for problems, all right? Uh, this is not the way to do business. What we want is to slowly increase our blood sugar levels, use that sugar and it slowly tails off as we are doing our daily activities. And then if our blood sugar levels get too low, your body will uh, start to break down glycogen stored in the liver and release that. And this is a natural process, this is good. So we'll release glycogen from the liver. And if we run out of that, if we don't have enough of that, we'll start breaking down fat. But when we're consuming refined grains and we're spiking our blood sugar, we're making fat. Okay, you're never gonna lose weight when you're consuming these very sugary food items. It's just not the way the body works. And further, you may have noticed that you can consume a very sweet product and then shortly thereafter, you feel hungry again. It's like, wow, this is crazy. Like I just had a bowl of ice cream, why am I hungry? And that's because when you spike your blood sugar and you start cranking out insulin, it drags your blood sugar levels back down and actually dips down below where it needs to be in some cases. And it makes you feel hungry yet again craziest thing you've ever seen in your life. Holy cow. All right, let's go here. So what I have for you is a nice breakdown of ways to reduce dietary sugar. I'm gonna tell myself, I've been teaching in this classroom for the last six hours. They finally all left and now I get to teach you guys for a little while. Uh, and here is an empty can of NOS energy drink. Now, I haven't looked yet but your daily intake added sugar should be about 32 grams. You as a human, you only need about 32 grams of sugar uh, to survive, not a big deal. Like if you wanna maintain a healthy, balanced diet, that's all you need in a day. Oh. You see it? 54 grams, 54 grams. Almost double. Almost double what you need, 54 grams daily value. <sighs> Almost double. You know, what can I say? It's dangerous, man. I, got, I drink this stuff that helps me uh, be upbeat and ready for class, but it's poison. This is a chronic uh, hepatotoxin. This is poisoning my liver over time with excess sugar and it can most certainly lead to cirrhosis and cancer. Need to cut it off, need to start drinking black coffee again. All right, <clears throat> so how can we reduce our dietary sugars? Well, we can eat fewer sweets such as candy and soft drinks and ice cream and pastries and not synergy drinks. We can eat more real food, real food. Eat more real food, i.e. Uh, fruits and, and uh, things without a lot of heavy syrup, real food, i.e vegetables and things will also have sugar. Use less sugar added in, so white, brown, or raw, what have you, get rid of it as best you can. Uh, avoid sweetened breakfast cereals. It's hard to do. Eat less jelly and jam. Seems like you're taking all the fun out, right? Jeez. Eating fresh fruit, avoiding artificial fruit juices. Artificial fruit juices, let me tell you. Uh, I remember many years ago, I had this like brainwave. I was like, I'm gonna cut out soft drinks and that's gonna make me healthier as a person. I was being a very healthy guy at the time. I was like, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cut out soft drinks. So what am I gonna drink? 
I'm going to drink palm, wonderful pomegranate juice and Welch's grape juice. Oh, this is great. I'm eating, drinking uh, fruit juice. This is the way. Then you look at the back and it's got more sugar in it than the daggum soft drinks do. <laughs> Your mind. All right, so drink more water. Okay, drink more water. That's what you really need is you need water. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. I think that'll do. Uh, avoid processed foods like pasta and rice and bread. Look at this. Avoid processed foods like bread and rice and pasta. Oh, look at this right here. Wow. Down here it says we should be eating almost exclusively bread and rice and pasta. It's crazy. It's a crazy world out there, team. All right, proteins. Ah, uh, let's see. So proteins are made up of amino acids and a lot of these you can build out of the random food items that you consume uh, but eight of them you must consume them in their correct forms uh, they are considered the essential amino acids we have to access these through our diet we can't just manufacture them from other things uh, a complete protein is something that will contain these essential amino acids that we cannot manufacture and when we're talking about complete proteins we tend to be talking about animal products okay like I said, if you want to get all the nutrients you need, you're not, you, you are what you eat. It's fake. Like you should eat what you are. You are meat. So if you eat meat, then you're getting all the nutrients you're supposed to get to survive. <laughs> Long story short. But uh, now you can be vegetarian or vegan and still get all your essential amino acids. But what this basically boils down to is you're going to be eating a lot of tofu, eating a lot of soy products. All right. Uh, Non-animal sources that are complete protein uh, sources, if you will, tend to revolve around soybeans. Okay, they tend to revolve around soybeans. And soy has a whole host of associated problems with it. Uh, mostly centering around the hormones that it produces. So there's a lot of estrogen floating around with soybeans, and that can lead to all kinds of issues, man. I had a student. Uh, she comes to me and she's talking to me about her um, uh, cycle. Okay, and apparently she's having two almost three periods a month and she can't figure out what the heck's going on she's like do i need to go to my gynecologist i was like yeah you obviously should go to your gynecologist uh but you know what's changed that that you know let's talk about what you're doing with your life and, and why that could be and it came out that she is just tearing through soy milk every day She's trying to be healthy. She's chowing down on soy milk every single day, like t two meals a day, she's chowing down on soy milk. And the long story short is that it was playing all kinds of heck with her uh, cycle. She cut the soy milk out, went back to normal. All that soy, potentially a problem. Uh, and by the way, let's, let's not play games here. You can also take supplemental like pill form of these and be in good shape. So there are certainly ways of doing this without consuming animal protein. Uh, incomplete protein sources are those which lack at least one of our essential amino acids. A lot of nuts and grains and things, but if you kind of mix it up and you're having a bunch of different types of nuts and grains and what have you, you'd be in good shape. That's all right. Uh, now, too much protein can lead to a whole host of issues. Kidney stones kind of fall into this realm, but lots of sugar also leads to kidney stones. And there, you know, has been research that has shown that eating high amounts of red meat can lead to cardiovascular disease. Uh, potentially on some misguided processes, but I'm going to stick to my guns here and say that you should be generally careful about consuming too much red meat. Generally careful. You should mix it up with some fish, for example. You, fish are wholly underserved in the realm of diet. All right, <clears throat> dietary requirements of protein really depends upon your age and your size and general metabolic rate based off of age and a whole host of issues. Uh, but you don't need a lot of protein to live. Only about a six ounce steak per day. And that's plenty for you, okay, plenty. What I'm trying to tell you is you're consuming two, three, four times that in most cases. In a day, you are getting lots of food. So what happens? We gain weight and then we gain more weight. So we become more sessile, so we gain more weight because we're eating more food. Real problem. Uh, that gum, I forgot I was going to show you guys. Uh, there are protein deficiencies that lead to uh, the classic big belly, little small arms. Uh, and I totally forgot to put that in here. So we're just going to leave that be for time being. Yeah. Now, there are some diets, like Atkins comes to mind, Paleo diet comes to mind, 
uh, where you can pretty much cut out carbohydrates and just rely on protein as an energy source. And um, I know folks that have really benefited from this, but you make your own decisions. We're gonna talk more about that in a second. All right, let's go here. Proteins are not all equal. Oh man, okay, first, first major issue, actually second, uh, this my plate concept where you can go and look up what you're supposed to be eating. One of the things about this is uh, that they don't differentiate on there between complex carbohydrates and refined grains. So they're just saying you should have this much carbohydrate in a day and you can just be eating it all in white bread. And if you're eating it all in white bread, it's going to spike your blood sugar and lead to accrual of fat and damage to the liver and all kinds of problems. You can eat the exact same number of calories in the form of uh, like nuts and whole grain products and be totally healthy by comparison. So be careful about too much refined grain. All right, same kind of story here with protein. Uh, there are different types of proteins, but they just say protein and they'll give you a rough estimate of amount of calories you should have in protein. Well, there is evidence out there that if you're consuming hardcore fatty red meat as your protein source exclusively, that can lead to atherosclerosis general non-healthy behavior. Uh, so you should really mix it up with different kinds of protein, right? Different kinds of protein to make sure that you're getting all the amino acids you need, the essential ones especially, um, while still being generally heart healthy, okay? Now let's move it on to fats. It's sort of the next realm. You eat a lot of protein, you're getting some fat. In the realm of fats, there are saturated fats, there are unsaturated fats, and then we're going to talk about trans fats and omega-3 fatty acids. Now, in the realm of fats, they come in a variety of different flavors. We're going to talk primarily about the triglycerides. Okay, the triglyceride is a glycerol backbone with one, two, three fatty acid chains. If you build these fatty acid chains using saturated fats, well, you're going to have a saturated fat. These tend to be of animal origin butter, bacon fat, all this stuff, tends to be solid at room temperature. Uh, and the theory is that if you're consuming high amounts of saturated fats, this can lead to heart attacks and strokes and what have you. Um, there is evidence of this, okay? There is evidence. There are, there are folks out there that would fuss about it, but there is certainly evidence for it. So my advice is err on the side of caution and just limit your saturated fat intake. By comparison, if you're building a diet, uh, you should mix in unsaturated fats. These tend to be of plant origin, olive oils, that kind of fun stuff, and fish-based oils tend to be of unsaturated nature as well. Speaking of which, let's talk about trans fats and omega-3 fatty acids, which are next. All right. <clears throat> trans fats are incredibly dangerous and will kill you. To the point that the government has come out with a statement that says trans fats are not generally recognized as safe. You need to be real careful about consuming high amounts of trans fats. You need to look at your foods. Does it say it contains trans fats or trans fat this? Does it say partially hydrogenated that? Then you need to be weary of it. It will cause heart disease because trans fats are a hell of a food preservative. You can cook food with trans fats and it'll pretty much be immoral because there's no enzymes in nature that can break it down. What we do is we take a standard kinked tail cis fatty acid and we bubble it through a hydrogen bath and we can change what's called its conformation. We take that double bond and we twist it, okay? We take it like this and we twist it on itself. And when you twist it, it becomes kind of straight. It looks and behaves a lot like a saturated fat, but it is not a saturated fat. It's got a double bond. What that means is, again, there's no enzymes in nature that can deal with it. So if you're cooking food with trans fats, it's pretty much mortal. Pause this video and go and look up uh, McDonald's Happy Meals that have sat around for 20 or 30 years. They're sitting around undamaged because they were cooked in trans fats. Pause the video and go look for old Happy Meals. It'll blow your mind, okay? Um, because there's no enzymes that can break this down, when you consume it, which you do all the time, uh, it builds up in your bloodstream. And when you have these fats building up in your bloodstream, it's going to lead to cardiovascular disease. You are going to have problems uh, with plaque buildup in your arteries. And the risk for heart disease is just astronomical. Astronomical. So you need to steer clear of anything that says partially hydrogenated and dodge trans fats like it's going out of style. Uh, then there's fish oil. So fish oil is sort of the opposite story. Uh, this is going to be a uh, 
unsaturated fat, but the tail, instead of being kinked or kind of flat, it forms a ring, all right? These are omega uh, threes, okay, omega threes. Uh, there's in groups of three. Go look it up. There's a reason to call this. The long story short is you can get this from fish. You can get this from certain vegetables. You can get this. Heck, I buy my kids milk that's enriched with DHA omega threes. Um, and what these do is they take your lipid panel and they just bring everything back into balance in a beautiful way. Man, I tell you, after my last little heart check thing that I have to do for work. I'm buying fish oil pills and I'm going to get myself back in a gym and I'm going to get healthy again because I want to see my kids grow up. All right? And mine's not even that bad. I'm telling you, this stuff is good for you. Okay, good for you. Uh, it supposedly makes your hair look better, your skin look better, your nails look better. But important for us is it's very what we call heart healthy. Okay? Brings your triglycerides down, uh, takes your HDL and LDL and gets them in the right locations. Boy, way better. And we think the... There's some theory out there as to how this works, but uh, we think that it's, this is a liver issue. So your liver has enzymes uh, that help you to um, build triglycerides. And when you have a lot of omega-3s and your liver tries to use these omega-3s to build triglycerides, it locks up the enzymes for the manufacture of those triglycerides. So your liver isn't able to make them in as high a rates as it would otherwise. And that is very healthy considering our diet right now. So by taking omega-3, this is a natural way of uh, bringing your lipid panel back into balance. And it's simple, cheap, it's easy, easy process. So omega-3s might not be the worst idea ever. All right, good. Let's go here. Uh, lipids, so let's see. Uh, our fear is that we're going to lead to arthrosclerosis, plaque buildup in our arteries, high blood pressure, general lack of health leading to cardiovascular disease, i.e. heart attacks, strokes, whatever. Uh, one of the ways that we deal with this is by monitoring our lipid panel and looking at our HDL and LDL levels. So uh, LDL is low density lipoproteins. These are considered the bad cholesterol. And the reason we call them bad cholesterol is these are increased by saturated fat and they lead to cholesterol flowing around in the bloodstream. So when cholesterol is moving around the body, that increases the risk of that getting into your arterial walls and, and problems therein. HDL is high density lipoprotein. It's considered the good cholesterol because it takes cholesterol to the liver to be removed as bile salts, basically. So when you've got high HDL, uh, the theory is you're pulling cholesterol out of the bloodstream. And the less cholesterol in your bloodstream, the better off you're going to be. So the numbers are anything above 60 for HDL, uh, anything below 100 for LDL, and your total should be about 180. If you can get in there and be around here, you're going to be relatively healthy, and omega-3s will help with that process. All right, uh, how can you reduce bad fats and cholesterol in your diet? Well, I provide you with a whole host of ways to do this, but I'm kind of running long in the tooth here, so I'm not going to read it to you. I would never throw all that on your test. Uh, this is a public service announcement. I want you to be healthy, so you should pause this and read these and consider them, okay? Let's go here. Vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. So minerals are things off the periodic table for the grand scheme of things like calcium and uh, potassium and phosphorus and sodium, or uh, yeah, sodium, magnesium, chloride. All of these are going to fall into the realm of minerals. <clears throat> the major minerals are found in pretty high or uh, a good bit higher doses in the body, if you will, and those are seen here. Those are the major minerals. And then we have a little bit of trace minerals, and trace minerals are things like iron used for hemoglobin and all that fun stuff. So necessary, but found in much smaller quantities, generally speaking. Uh, and then we have vitamins. Vitamins are much more complicated. Vitamins are big organic molecules. Like here's vitamin A that's used in your eyes. Here's folate that's used for um, general reproductive success and, and cellular division. These are big vitamins, okay? They're large molecules, big ring carbon structures. They are um, uh, hydrocarbons in the grand scheme. And important, okay, important. Now, antioxidants, that's where I wanna be. So antiox antioxidants are chemicals that decrease the rate of oxidation or transfer of electrons, i.e. free radicals from cellular metabolism. That palm, wonderful pomegranate juice, go and watch the commercials for it. It says something like antioxidant crushing power or something like that. 
Uh, the idea is that through our cellular metabolism, we do release what are called free radicals. And these free radicals have the ability to oxidize cells and or tissues in our body. They can lead to damage of cells, of, of small molecules, of a whole host of things. And free radicals are problematic. So we need to get rid of these as best as we can. And the idea is we can take, uh, or we can consume foods that are high in antioxidants, i.e. a lot of fruits, vegetables, and that should limit our free radical buildup in the system. And it works, okay? You can uh, have a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables and the problems associated with free radicals does indeed decrease. But the fun thing about this is we can also administer pill form antioxidants and we see no real change in the body's dynamics. So is free radical busting antioxidants, is that a real thing? Or is it just if you eat more fruits and grains, you eat less sugar and fats and what have you? And it's probably the latter. Probably by eating more fruits and grains and things which are considered antioxidants or containing antioxidants, we're probably just having a healthier diet overall so we live, healthy, live healthier lives. Uh, so you can take it for what you will. Go do some reading. It's my advice. Best advice I can give you. All right, uh, now I moved this slide around a little bit because I wanted to talk about it after I did minerals, so calcium. Uh, calcium is very important. We need good calcium intake, uh, theoretically, for strong bones. Let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, the issue is that most of the time when we talk about our diet, we look at the My uh, Plate references, they talk about dairy. Uh, and it's not necessary that we have dairy products. We just need the calcium. You can take pill form calcium. You know, multivitamins and minerals, we can, we can get this. The recommendation that is given by the government is to have at least three glasses of a low-fat milk or three servings of general dairy products per day to prevent osteoporosis. You can just take calcium and do the same thing. Really, calcium and a vitamin D supplement would be where it's at, but that's not a general dairy. By the way, vitamin D is a vitamin, <laughs> okay? Uh, now, where am I going? Okay, so all that fat from the milk, man, that's a huge amount of calorie intake. And we have too many calories in our diet. So you can get away with taking these in pill form, you can go to public to buy it all, and you can avoid all, the, avoid all those calories just by drinking milk and having them in pill form. Uh, not to mention huge amounts of Americans are lactose intolerant, and when that's the case and they see dairy, they're starting to drink soy milk, and that leads to other issues, man. Jeez. So we here in the US, we actually have a massive intake of dairy compared to most other countries. And we also have one of the highest rates of osteoporosis, uh, hip fractures, general bone damage. I'm not sure there's a good link between calcium intake and healthy bones. I mean, you obviously need to have the raw materials, but we're drinking lots and lots of milk and we're still seeing problems. I think one of our bigger issues is our lack of movement and motility. We're very sessile. We in the U.S. are incredibly sessile critter, critters. We don't move around much. And if we would get more exercise, that would alleviate most of our problems. Yeah, that's good enough. And here's a nice breakdown of all this stuff that I've been talking about. If you want to know a little bit more about vitamins and minerals uh, and where they're coming from and what they're for, I provided this for you by no stretch of the imagination. Let me check my time here. But no stretch of the imagination would I ever uh, ask you to relay any of this to me. I simply want to provide you with some good data. So if you want to take this and blow it up and look at it, it's all there. Okay, it's just for you. Now, I want to give you a little bit more information and then we'll call it a day. So cellular respiration is what we're dealing with here. We make our uh, ATP via cellular respiration. This is how we do business. And cellular respiration has four steps. Glycolysis, which happens out in the cytoplasm. Uh, prep reaction, citric, uh, citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chains. This is how we make our ATP. But when you're looking at the formula for these, it's almost exclusively glucose that's coming in. And I don't know about you, but I don't consume a lot of straight glucose. I try not to, at least. It'd be very damaging to your tissues, spiking your insulin levels like that. Uh, most of the foods that we consume are, are a whole host of things. Is there glucose there? I mean, yeah, a little bit. I mean, the potatoes are going to be broken down into glucose eventually, but they got a lot of fiber and vitamins and minerals in them. There, there's, you know, beef and protein and fat here, a lot of butter. You know, you got your ve uh, veggies, your green veggies. They'd have a little bit of sugar in them as well, but very little, lots of fiber. So how does this get plugged into that? And the answer is like this, <laughs> all right? Uh, let me lay this on you a little bit different way. We, we break down the foods that we consume, catabolic reactions, we 
break them down via uh, hydrolysis, as we discussed when we were talking about digestion. There's a lot of hydrolysis reactions. We break things down. And as we break them down, we're releasing energy, and that energy and high energy molecules can be plugged into this uh, cycle, if you will, can be plugged into this cycle in a variety of different pathways, okay? Uh, so we can break things down and build them up to form different molecules. For instance, uh, fats, we break these down. This is really important, absolutely. Fats, we break them down into like glycerol and their fatty acid chains, and all of this can be stuck into these formulas in a whole host of different ways. Like, I'm not gonna go into detail. Take biology one, <laughs> or if you'll see all about this. You could probably use my YouTube channel and hunt this down in my cellular respiration lecture. I do a whole hour long lecture on pretty much this slide, uh, but I'm not gonna do that now for obvious reasons. But the, the nature of this is that we can certainly break fats down and plug them into the cycle and still form ATP from it. So you can go on a diet where you're having virtually no carbohydrate intake and you can still make ATP like it's going out of style because we can use our fatty acids and break them down and plug them in at different rates uh, and still make all the ATP we need. You may have heard of a ketogenic diet, ketones. Ketones are one of the breakdown products of this and they get plugged into this uh, citric acid cycle as they go, okay? Uh, so we can certainly uh, use fats and break them down to manufacture ATP via cellular respiration. Same thing with proteins. Proteins, we break them down into amino acids. We deaminate them, we remove their NH2 groups, get rid of that, and we can use all the rest of it to plug into different phases of the um, cellular respiratory pathway and uh, make all the energy we need using proteins. It's absolutely reality. Uh, now, there are certain tissues in your body that really like to have glucose. The brain is a famous one of these. Your brain loves glucose as an energy source. So in that situation, what we can actually do is we can break down proteins through catabolic processes and then rebuild through an anabolic process glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis gluconeogenesis that means new glucose making okay uh, we can break down proteins break down their whole structure and then reassemble them to build glucose and then send that to the brain to feed the brain so we have our ways of doing these things all right so it's not the end of the world and let me say this when you're going ketogenic when you're having to build glucose through this process chill bumps again this is really energetically expensive really really energetically expensive. So what that does is it burns massive quantities of energy. And if you're a little overweight, boy, you can drop it fast, go in ketogenic and burn it through uh, proteins in this fashion. Um, I'm not telling you it's the way to do business, but it's something you can look into. Paleo diets, ketogenic diets, Atkins diets, same, you know, same concept, even a Mediterranean diet for some degree. All right, <clears throat> metabolic syndrome. Holy cow. Okay, so where to even start? Metabolic syndrome uh, is a precursor to bigger problems. This is a set of um, attributes that show us that we're headed down the wrong path. Uh, the classic example that people go to is body shape. If you have an apple shaped body, like a round belly, but you look pretty normal otherwise. Uh, that's classic metabolic syndrome. Like if you can turn around backwards and look in the mirror and you look pretty normal, but then you turn sideways and you got problems, that tends to be metabolic syndrome. So what's happening here? Uh, blood pressure starts going up, blood sugar gets too high, body fat build up around the waist, your cholesterol and your triglycerides are all going haywire. What this does is it leads you towards heart disease, stroke, certain types of liver cancers in particular, and diabetes, okay? Uh, so what I want to do is talk about the real killer here, one of the real problems that we're seeing, and that is, well, hang on, I'm going to get there eventually. We're going to talk about diabetes in detail. Uh, I want to uh, broach these subjects with you because it's worth your time. Basal metabolic rate, or BMR, you'd be quoting this on your test, all right? Basal metabolic rate, what this is, is the amount of calories you need to um, sustain body function in a day. Like when you're growing quickly, you need lots of calories to sustain your general body function. Whereas when you're an adult, it kind of tails off and the older you get, the less you need because you're being sassled. 
Um, so your basal metabolic rate changes over time, your metabolism changes. When I was in high school, I could eat anything in the world and just burn it off like it was going out of style. That is no longer the case because I've gotten older and I'm not growing anymore, at least not in a good way. Uh, then there's BMI or body mass index. Uh, what we can do is we can take your height and your weight and your sex and kind of figure out where you should be to be a healthy person. Uh, so I, I've left this pretty big so you can use your kind of general height and your weight and you can work out numbers. Uh, and where you want to be is between 18 by 25. Okay. Uh, otherwise we run into problems. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Normal overweight obese. Yeah. And remember, 70% uh, plus of Americans are up there, which is terrifying. All right, diabetes mellitus. Let's talk a little bit about it. I'm gonna try to hurry because my batteries are dying here. Um, diabetes is the most prevalent metabolic disease in the world. This tends to be an issue with either not releasing enough of or it not working dealing with insulin. So you're not releasing enough insulin or it ain't working anymore. Okay, what are conditions of this? Uh, polyuria or an excessive urine output and that leads to polydipsia and increased thirst and eventually polyphagia and increased hunger. Uh, this is very easy to diagnose because we can see glucose in the urine and ketones for that matter. Long story as to why that is, but we'll get there later. Uh, but glucose in the urine is the idea here. So how the heck does it all happen? Well, let me just lay it all on you and hope that my battery doesn't die in the short period of time I have left. I'm going to get a new battery. Executive decision. Hang on. Better. Better battery power. Okay. So where was I? We were talking about polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. So what happens here is, as you'll find when we do the urinary system, uh, your urinary tract, your kidney tubules, uh, they have transport proteins. And what these will do is, when fluid is moving through them, they will be transport proteins and take up nutrients that are in the urine flow and remove it from the urine flow and stick it back into the bloodstream. Because we don't want to be voiding nutrients in our urine. I mean, your ancestors had to work really, really hard to get those nutrients, you know, in a variety of different ways. You don't want to lose it as urine. That would be a huge mistake. Uh, so what we do is we have these transport proteins and they take up excess nutrients from the urine and they stick them back into the blood supply where they're supposed to be. Well, uh, your normal blood sugar should be like 100 or so if you've just had food, maybe 120, um, but at rest, it should be about 70. We're talking about folks that are having 230, 240 milligrams per deciliter of blood sugar. And once you reach that rate, there's so much sugar running through your urinary system that your transport proteins reach what's called a transport maxima. They, they can't work any faster than they already do. So urine starts to have sugar flow out with it. So sugar starts to leave in the urine and that plays all kinds of hell with the osmotic balance because water tends to follow solutes, you're gonna find soon. And um, as water chases that sugar out of the body, uh, it causes you to be releasing copious amounts of, of urine. And if you're releasing copious amounts of urine, that means that your blood osmolarity is gonna change and it's gonna make you get really thirsty. So you get really thirsty, that's poly, uh, I'm sorry, you're, you pee a lot, you go to the bathroom a lot, you urinate copious quantities, that's polyuria. Uh, and then polydipsia is this intense thirst. Okay, because you're losing all this water, you get this intense thirst, and I mean intense. Uh, I've seen people just about ready to throw themselves out of a car to get something to drink. And here's the problem. Modern diet. What are we drinking? Coke and Dr. Pepper? A lot of sugar in there. You're just continuing the process. And then polyphagia falls right in with it. Get hungry as a result of low blood glucose. And there's our dead battery. Let me put that down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Causing dehydration, causing thirst. Devil-edged sword. All right, 34.2 million people in the U.S. have diabetes. The vast majority of these are type 2 diabetic. Only a small percentage are type 1. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, this is childhood onset in most cases, or in almost all cases, probably between 10 and 14 years old, I guess. Don't quote me on that one, though. But childhood onset all the same. Type 2 diabetes was oftentimes called adult onset diabetes. And it's characterized by insulin resistance. Okay? Uh, you can imagine that your cells have receptors and you can downregulate those receptors by just 
bathing them in insulin all the dad gum time so they become down regulated they don't respond to insulin anymore they are insulin resistant so that's getting diabetes typically as a result of diet and exercise and high blood sugar from foods we eat anyway so general symptoms of this frequent urination weird hunger and thirst weight changes typically gain uh, blurred vision slow healing sores and really propensity towards infections if your blood's really uh, sugary, then that's a nutrient source and you can end up with major problems. Fatigue, uh, because of all that sugar in the bloodstream, it plays all kinds of hell with your nerves and their ion exchange capacity. So you end up with blindness, uh, losing limbs, nerve deterioration, kidneys are struggling to keep up with all this blood sugars, so you end up with kidney disease. All of this causes chronic inflammation, which leads to cardiovascular disease. Something you want to dodge, man. So something you want to dodge. Again, type one diabetes, very rare by comparison. Uh, whereas type two diabetes is the vast majority. Insulin resistance, risk factors, obesity being one of the main ones amongst these. And certain ethnic groups are also have a propensity towards type two diabetes. All right. Yeah, yeah. This can pretty well be managed uh, by behavior and diet. Just gonna be straight honest with you. When you start showing the signs of metabolic syndrome, you can either continue down the path you're going and land here, or you can change the way you're doing business and be healthy and, yeah, be healthy. <laughs> it reminds me of this old man I saw. Uh, we were at the beach a while back and we we're taking family pictures and this guy, the old guy walks up and he's like, hey, can I take a picture for you? And he's just healthy as a horse, you can tell, man. Like good, you know, help, good muscular size, big healthy guy didn't have a bunch of belly fat and i was like man i want to be that when i get older you want to avoid this because i got a lot of family that's here and you want to avoid it and that takes us to our ending um look i'm not going to tell you gary Talbs has all the issues in hand i'm not going to tell you he has all the answers you need but it's not the worst thing you've ever done in life to read this book why we get that and what to do about it uh you'll read it in about every three pages you'll slam it down and be like son of a what how what how did this happen how did we get here this is ridiculous it, it'll it'll really open your eyes okay it'll really open your eyes in a way that you wouldn't expect uh so read that book that's my advice you can go on amazon and buy it for five bucks okay uh, not the worst thing you've ever done to read why we get fat and what to do about it. There's also a longer version called Good Carbs, Bad Carbs. Maybe Good Calories, Bad Calories. That's the one, like, if you're an intensive scientist and you want more detail, you read that one. And this is the short version for layman, why we get fat and what to do about it. If you want to really blow your own mind and just be ticked off, read that book. And then maybe you can make some changes get you where you need to be. I know I'm going to start trying to because I want to see my kids grow up. So this is me signing off, man. Give it a try. And let's see where it takes us. Nutrition is a huge problem for us here in the U.S. And boy, there's only one person to blame. And you see them every time you look in the mirror. You can choose to have better activity levels. You can choose to eat a better diet. Uh, and I'm gonna to try to do better myself. All right, thanks folks.